Hello and welcome to Legendary Africa, the podcast where disembodied voice speaks about African myths, legends, and folklore straight into your ear canal. Today I have a wonderful guest joining me on the show. He's an author, a lover of Norse myths and Icelandic sagas, a musician, and a game designer. I am delighted to welcome onto Legendary Africa, Joshua Gillingham, author of The Gatewatch and creator of the board game All Thingy. Josh, welcome to Legendary Africa. Hi, Deshira. Thanks so much for having me on. It's so great to be back. Thank you so much for coming back on. Last time you were here, the podcast was still called Legendary. I, I love that name. And I, I, uh, I, I continue to strive to stay legendary, as your, as your tagline says. Yes. So a lot has changed since then, and you've been, you've been very, very busy. And the latest thing is your board game, All Thingy. So I wanted to sort of jump right in and ask you to walk me through what it's all about, how the gameplay works, etc. Great. Yeah. So uh, this card game sort of came out of my uh, studies of the Norse myths, like you said, and the Icelandic sagas. Uh, this was prior to even writing my books. Um, I, I just kind of became obsessed with the stories. Um, uh, I think you can probably relate to when you get into a good mythology, it just sort of like draws you in, right? And you're it's, it's so vivid and you just sort of like eat up like any sort of like scrap or like piece of information or story or, or anything right you can get uh, to it and uh, my study of the Norse myths led me of course to the Icelandic sagas and in fact one of the reasons we know so much about the Norse myths is because uh, Icelanders preserve them uh, by writing them down um, in the 12th century and uh, because they did that um, uh, we've got a recollection of uh, their beliefs and some of their uh, uh, sort of cultural stories I really appreciate that um, and, and in finding the Icelandic sagas I, I discovered all these interesting characters some are more famous for example I uh, a lot of people know about Leif Erikson. So Leif Erikson features heavily in Vinland Saga, which is uh, a saga about uh, a trip to North America that Vikings took um, and is fairly famous uh, here in Canada and the US at least. Uh, we talk about it a lot because we're kind of excited about that. It kind of involves us. Uh, and for a long time, people thought that that was sort of a made up story. Uh, of course, now we know uh, in Los Alamitos, there are some archaeological evidence that the uh, you know, Vikings did actually arrive there, whether that was Leif Erikson and his crew, or maybe another uh, party of Vikings, we're not sure. Um, but uh, all these characters ended up being really interesting. And there are characters that are not so famous, uh, some that m- many people may not know about, for example, Grettir the Strong, who's this sort of uh, tragic hero, this outlaw who is always kind of trying to do the right thing, but things don't really end up working out for him. There's Al the Cirrus, or Al the Deep Minded, who is this uh, uh, basically a Viking queen from Scotland, who uh, her husband and her son are killed and she flees to Iceland and becomes sort of this matriarchal um, founding figure of the uh, Iceland as a country, but also sort of as a culture as well. And so anyways, I was inspired by all these characters and I thought, um, you know, I've written this book. This is kind of cool. I'd really like to capture some of this in a game. And uh, so I, I do design board games and I, I run a game design group. And so I, I'd done a few before, um, always Viking theme. Vikings are kind of my thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this came up. I thought, wow, could I put the player in the seat of an Icelander uh, right at sort of the founding of the country? And what's cool about Iceland is you can actually point back to um, about 900 AD. And that, that was the founding of the country because uh, people had not been inhabiting Iceland before that period of time. It was very remote. If you look at a map, it's way, way, way out in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, there is some evidence that there may have been like a Irish monastery set up on one of the islands um, prior, maybe 600 AD, but it doesn't look like uh, that lasted either. Um, the people who had founded it passed away or they had sort of abandoned it and left it there. So um, it, it's really interesting uh, t- a period in uh, time. It's the height of the Viking Age, all that kind of stuff. And I thought, wow, let's uh, let's try to capture this. So. Uh, to the game, players take on the role of a chieftain in early Iceland. And one of the unique features of Iceland was that they they tried to preserve the Norse laws. Uh, and so there was a law code that the Vikings followed. There was also sort of a political structure um, that involved uh, something called a thing. Now, that's not a thing as we think of it in English, but it's sort of a gathering of the uh, wealthy folks, uh, men and women, powerful landholders, farmers, uh, those sorts of things. And they would gather and they would um, barter, treat, uh, trade, they'd feast. Most importantly, they'd settle legal disputes. And in Iceland, there was a very special thing called the All Thing. And the All Thing uh, involved people from all over the island. And they gather in this place called Thingular which you can still visit today. It's a national park in Iceland now. Um, and they do this uh, very same thing and they preserve the system of government. This actually lasted in Iceland way past um, when it would have in mainland Europe, for example, in Norway and Sweden and Denmark, uh, and in some of the Viking uh, towns and cities in Scotland and Ireland, because um, they were influenced by uh, Christianity. Uh, monarchies became sort of the standard 
uh, governmental structure for countries in Europe at that time. But in Iceland, they kind of preserved and continued this long after. And so uh, as one of the powerful chieftains in the game, you are trying to bribe Vikings as they arrive to the Althingi to join your camp and support your cause, uh, while also trying to... Um, have the Vikings in your camp, the ones who are supporting you, uh, challenge other Vikings to home gang or to duels. Uh, and the Vikings in other camps for other chieftains, by challenging them home gang, you can kind of strategically uh, decrease their influence while increasing your influence. And the point of the game is to uh, gather the most influence to yourself. And whoever has the most influence controls the L thingy and wins the game. So that is a very long-winded answer to a very short question. But yeah, that's uh, that's the background of the game and sort of uh, how it works. It's quick to set up, under a minute to set up. It's a card game, so it's fairly light to carry around, and it plays between about 30 to 40 minutes. So it's uh, uh, a nice short game, great for people who are new to the board game table with enough strategic elements to kind of keep people who are regular board gamers, like myself, uh, engaged. I absolutely love the historical uh, background and, you know, <laughs> focusing on African myths, you know, you just don't have that when you look at myths about Africa, just because the history is unfortunately lacking. So it's really amazing that um, all this history has been preserved. So I just wanted to ask another question about the game. Why why a card game? Great question. Great question. This was it was sort of like the theme of the game I felt lent itself to a card game, but from a board designer, a board game designer's perspective, um, yeah, it's also a really nice medium to work with. Uh, cards are pretty popular in games. Uh, they're sort of a traditional uh, piece that would be used in game design. Uh, they're also super light. They're easy to print. So, um, for example, a lot of newer games right now, like uh, the like 3D printed miniatures, which are super cool, but also super expensive to design, super ex uh, expensive to print. And of course, the person who ends up paying that eventually, uh, after the designer, is the person who purchases the game. And so one of the ways I wanted to make this game accessible was in the components, and so cards are a great way to do that. Um, that being said, I wanted to do something a little bit new with cards. And so uh, I felt like I was able to use cards in a bit of a different way um, than I've seen in other games in some unique sort of ways. So for example, um, there are these field cards. And the field cards are flipped sort of horizontally so that when you place the Vikings on them, uh, there's little markers that come out from where the card is there that show the north, east, west, and South Chieftain's positions for placing their bribes as they're bribing Vikings or equipping their weapons. Um, and so I was able to almost like use the cards like a, a game table, which is kind of fun. And as game designers, you're always looking for ways to do that, right? Uh, taking the components you have and just maximizing what they're doing for the game. That being said, I also was able to be highly involved in the uh, design and layout. So I worked with an artist, uh, Lana Shostova, and she's a Viking reenactor as well. And so she brought a lot of that sort of historical authenticity into the game in terms of the costuming and the treasures and the weapons. Uh, and then I was uh, on the other end doing the graphic design, the layout of the cards. And that was a lot of fun um, because, uh, you know, uh, it's a very physical thing. You pick up a card, you know, what do you see? How can you make everything visible, but you've got such a small space to work with? It's a kind of a unique design challenge. So, um, yeah. And last but not least, it's just everybody's, you know, uh, if they're a board gamer has gone to somebody else's house and it's, it's tough to lug a massive, you know, two foot by three foot game thing, you know, up the stairs and through elevators and stuff like that. Whereas this card game uh, is, it's, it's not going to be small, but it's going to be uh, very transportable, easy to put in a bag, easy to put in a backpack. And those are all considerations that game designers think about that um, regular board game players who don't design games might not think about, right? Um, uh, obviously, we all love the art and we like talking about the mechanics and the theme, but uh, all those other considerations are things to uh, sort of put on the table and to uh, inspect and sort of reflect on when you're designing a game. Well, I think it's really great that you're uh, thinking about the buyer of the game as well. So obviously, you're into games, you're an amazing writer. How did these two interests combine to form the game? You already told me about where the inspiration came from. Um, historical games, was that always something that interested you? Uh, you know what? Um, I have designed a few games. Some are historically themed. Some of are, are more a little bit inspired by the myths. Um, but it's funny because I think a lot of people, I, they've, they've said that a similar thing to me in terms of like, oh, you like you write books, you design games. These are two like totally separate things that, you know, would never overlap. Like, how are you good at like two things? But to be honest, when I think about game design, I think about writing novels. I, uh, You know, it, they seem so, so similar to me. And I'll maybe like highlight a few ways in which I think they are. Uh, one is that when you are writing a novel... And when you're playing a game, you're both uh, in both contexts, just telling a story, right? It's a little bit more straightforward when you are writing a book because you're the one who's sort of narrating it and you're sort of guiding the reader through. 
when you're designing a game, though, you're sort of setting up a scenario, even if it's not like a role playing game like D&D, uh, even if it's just a regular board game, you are sort of like setting up a world that uh, people can step into and kind of have their own adventure or their own story in. And uh, I think board games, especially in the last 20 years, um, have really gotten better at capturing that sort of aspect of gaming. So, for example, you know, back in the day, um, you know, the board games, when people thought of board games, they think of Clue or Monopoly. And those aren't um, they're not bad games. Uh, but I do think that uh, more modern games have really been a little more innovative in their themes and uh, uh, their mechanics and have been able to uh, provide a much richer narrative experience for people. So uh, on the first hand, I would just say that I, would say, I, I see them as two different modes of storytelling and um, both involve uh, walking people through a narrative. The second thing I would say is that when you're writing characters in a story, you have to treat them like people and you have to think about, well, what would they do and uh, what would their reaction be? How would they say this? Um, what would their response be to this sort of scenario? And it's the same thing you have to do in game design. When you set up the mechanics for game design, you really have to put yourself in the player's seat saying, okay, if I had these resources or I was in this position or is being challenged in this way, uh, what would my best strategy be? Or what would my possible strategies be? And one of the biggest aspects of game design is trying to figure out all the ways in which people will break your game because people are very uh, creative and uh, they're very resourceful. And uh, no matter how good you think your game is in the first draft, when you put it on the table, somebody will find a way to break it, right? There's some rule you haven't thought of, right? That's, that's going to crop up. And that's why playtesting is important. But in that aspect, I find that game design and writing novels are, are very similar that way too. Obviously, there are differences. But um, uh, yeah, to me at the core, they're both just telling a story and kind of trying to understand people and how they're going to respond to what you're creating. The other similarities also that I mean, I haven't actually written a book myself, but when you write something, you also have to think about what the person reading it is kind of expecting, what's going to think, uh, what they're going to think about. And I think when you design a game, it's kind of the same thing. You have to step into the role of the person who's going to play the game. Yes, yes. And people have quite strong emotional reactions if they feel like you're not considering their experience, like both in books and in game design. So if you if you create a book with a you know a scene, you're, you're meaning it to go one way, but you haven't really considered how somebody else might read it, um, that can go very badly very quickly, right? Uh, same thing with the game. If you create a game with a very sort of flimsy mechanic um, and you put it on the table, like people will get, um, you know, not, maybe not angry, but a little bit sort of like annoyed and frustrated that, you know, like, you know, you put this game together, I'm trying to step into this, um, you know, world and have this experience and you just, you haven't, created the parameters for it. You haven't constructed it very well. And so uh, I think it's very important. A lot of people say, oh, you know, I, I just write for myself. It's my passion. Um, you know, I don't care if other people read it. And that's fine. If you, if you do it that way, that's great. But I think if you want to publish games, if you want to publish books, that's a really important consideration to have. And to just put it in front of other people, because as much as you sit and try to consider how other people are going to react to it, sometimes you just need to give it to playtesters or to beta readers and, and get their response and just sort of honor that reaction and say, uh, you know, is this landing? Is this uh, resonating with people? Are they sort of emotionally connecting with characters? Are they getting invested in the game mechanic? Or are they just finding kind of blah? Or does it kind of make them upset? Or are they just kind of bored, right? So yeah, um, that sort of feedback and response is, is important, I think, in both cases. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, books and games, they're both interactive to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, so when we chatted during our first interview together uh, a good few months ago for your book, The Gate Watch, we did delve a little bit into um, your family's influence over your writing, particularly your grandmother's influence. Was there any sort of similar kind of family influence over your love for historical games or games in general? That's a great question. Uh, my family always loved to play games. We're definitely sort of, especially my dad's side, sort of a board gaming family. My mom's side, more cards. So on my mom's side, the classic game is Canasta, right? When the when the family gets together, we always have these big Canasta tournaments and all the cousins play. And we all started playing when we were, uh, you know, four years old. So so that was big. So maybe I, I, I probably have to uh, tip my hat a little bit to them for the card game aspect. And on the other side, uh, that family really loved board games. So I remember playing Risk with my uncles at Christmas time. And I'd play chess with my great grandma uh, from Norway. And she would she would never give me an inch. She would just crush me every time, even though I was like 10 years old. Just, oh, never, no mercy ever, uh, which was great. So, and that, uh, of course, chess is one of the great games of, of strategy, right? Kind of getting that sort of um, uh, strategic mind uh, set going so that you can, uh, you know, uh, figure out how you're going to attack, figure out how you're going to defend, try to set up traps, all those sorts of things I think play well into trying to create a board game because you kind of have to be playing the game in your head with yourself a few times before you can kind of get it out on a prototype. So definitely. And at last but not least, I'll just say like 
my parents met on a music team. Uh, and I, I guess we'll talk a little bit more about music stuff a little bit later on. But I think that was another big uh, thing that I have to give them credit for was that I was just raised in a household. I think this is the same with you. Like I know you're very creative. I know your father writes uh, as well. Um, being raised in a household where you know creative things were encouraged, creative things were supported and uh, uh, sort of seen as a positive thing is great. I talked to a lot of creators who had to fight really hard against a home culture that was, you know, this is a waste of time, or this is superfluous, or, you know, this isn't going to serve you in your career as a, uh, an accountant in the future, no hate against accountants, but you know, for whatever reason, that always seems to be the one. Um, so yeah, uh, all, all those things, I think played into it. Maybe this is my own thing, too. But I feel like anytime you create something, uh, as much as it's like, you know, an original work, and you're inspired by other people, it's also sort of a reflection of your experience. So uh, I would say like, any game, any book, any novel, as much as I'd love to say, it's just this Thing that's kind of you know like out in the universe that's kind of separate from me uh, obviously like um, I, I was a part of creating it the people who are in my life kind of influenced me all of that sort of gets worked together so it's kind of a cool you know creation slash reflection uh now i'm getting super deep on the creative stuff okay all right all right well you gave me a mic so i'm gonna hold you responsible but yeah that's my that's my take no, i mean it definitely makes sense if whenever you put something out there it's got to reflect on you at, in some small or large extent but that's amazing um Still speaking about our thingy, the artwork, I love it. I heard a little bit about it when you talked to Antoine Clark's podcast, The Myth, Legend, and Law podcast. I've seen the artwork as traditionally drawn, a beautiful sketching style. Why did you choose this kind of traditional art and not, I mean, digital and graphic novel type style is very popular these days. Why did you choose traditional art? Great question. So this is actually a really unique feature of this game is that I, I kind of did something that game designers are not supposed to do. Um, I kind of, uh, uh, I got myself involved in the actual art of the game. Now, typically, if you're a game designer, what you do is you design a game and you kind of create like a really rough prototype, like clip art off the internet kind of stuff. And then you pitch it to publishers. And if they like it, the publisher will kind of choose the art and get the art done with their own aesthetic. And from there, you kind of just let your game go and it goes to publication and you're kind of finished in that, in that process. You might help sort of promote it stuff like that and obviously you get royalties but that's um that's typically how it goes on the other hand um i had such a strong vision for this game that i didn't really want to leave that up to chance to kind of give it even though there's, there's some great publishers here in canada great ones in the states and um, all over the world um i really had a vision for this and i wanted to see that kind of to completion so uh, i was careful about selecting an artist um back and forth with several different artists before i ended up uh, deciding to go with uh, lada for this uh, project and i could see that she had sort of the same vision she sent me a few sketches of things that she was thinking for the game and i thought wow this is this is really capturing what i'm going for i knew on one hand uh, it wasn't going to be practical to have you know like realistic like lifelike sort of uh, like we're not going to do photos of reenactors or anything in the in the game but i also didn't want to go too cartoon style because uh, i did want to capture some of that historical accuracy um and so i I thought that kind of the fine line between both of those was uh, exactly what Lada had done. And in fact, uh, I really, I asked her, like, I, I want the art to be gritty. I think that came through really well. And I also didn't want just a bunch of, you know, sort of like supermodels who are all just like, you know, these beautiful, beautiful. So there's, I mean, there's young people and there's old people, there's thin people and there's large people. There's people who are kind of very like ragged and rugged looking. And there's people who look, you know, they look all sorts of different things. Um, and I wanted that sort of diversity of uh, representation uh, that way, uh, you know, people as actual people. But I also, wanted them to sort of be a little bit gritty so not everybody's sort of like smiling like they're in the family photo but i mean we're in iceland and it's the viking age and things are tough and a lot of the people who end up going to iceland are actually fleeing um sort of political persecution back in norway there was a king who was just mercilessly taking control of every region uh sort of eating up norway piece by piece to kind of create the kingdom that we call norway today and so uh i i think lada did a great job of that too it's characters are kind of very stern you kind of get the sense they've got this sort of gritty edge and um her experience as a viking reenactor really played into it as well she's an incredibly talented artist but was also able to, especially with costuming, uh, figure out what would have been accurate for the time. Which, for Viking games, I can tell you as a, someone who loves, loves, loves Viking games and Viking themed games, um, is not very common. Most of the Viking themed games, I'm thinking of some of my favorites, uh, like Blood Rage. I love Blood Rage. Uh, that's a fun one. And um, Reavers of Midgard, that's a cool one too. Uh, but the, the historical accuracy of a lot of those are, are not quite... Um, to the same extent. It's a little bit more the kind of the Hollywood version of, of Vikings. And uh, we've got a really positive response. Um, both people who are into Vikings and people who are more into board games uh, say like the game looks fresh. Uh, it's an interesting sort of setting. Uh, not a lot of games are set in historical uh, time periods. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, an actual historical event, a lot of them are in time periods, I should say. Uh, but that's that's been cool. It's just it's a unique game and I don't think there's anything else like it out there. And I'm kind of proud to be able to say that that art really contributed to that factor. 
I mean, the art certainly worked for me. Um, I've maybe looked at some of the art about three times, but now when, when someone mentions art thingy on Twitter, that the artwork is literally the first thing that comes to mind. So it's definitely <laughs> eye-catching. And I think, That's yeah, great. it's it's a bit dark, it's a bit gritty. I think it's it really, uh, authenticity is the right word. It really grabs you and puts you into that age. Yeah, that's really what I was hoping to, um, to to go for, and yeah, yeah, and hopefully it uh, reflects the table too. Um, the, the gameplay is a, you know it's a political struggle, so you know hopefully the players kind of feel like they're almost like one of those characters too, sort of you know trying to survive and trying to just you know um, establish themselves at the all thingy. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really excited how it, how it came together. Uh, it was a big gamble because, like I said, uh, uh, designers don't usually get involved with the art, um, and the problem with that is if you create art that a publisher doesn't like, uh, they might not want to publish your game or you may have wasted your time with the art because they might just redo all the art anyways for their own style. But Out- Outland Entertainment was great. Um, they love the aesthetic. They do a lot of graphic novels and comic books to begin with. And so they, they kind of like that feel. It wasn't exactly like their other stuff, but it, it fit well enough that, um, yeah, it was it was it kind, of, it kind of fell under the umbrella of their brand too. So yeah, that was great. So I've got one more question about Althing, and then I promise we can move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I know you said, you told me, you know, why you chose uh, it to be a card game, a board game. In the time of coronavirus, where people can't always sit together and play a card game, are you considering it all, you know, uploading it or uh, making it somehow available online or bringing it to the console world? That is a great question. I'll be 100% honest. My head has been in this Kickstarter uh, for the last few weeks, and that's come up several times. People have asked, you know, is it going to be online? And uh, uh, you know what? I I hope we can eventually. Um, Obviously, these are challenging times, and things are changing. Some things are maybe changing for the better in terms of, you know, people are being more uh, hygienic and more aware of sort of how diseases spread and how they might or may not be contributing to that. In other ways, though, you know, I I feel like a sense of grief uh, from a lot of people, too, and that, you know, the world used to be one way and now it's a different way. And one of the things I always loved about board games was that it wasn't on a screen, right? You were like actually sitting around a table with people playing a game. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I hope uh, as, as things progress and we work towards finding some solutions that people can continue to sort of meet and gather. And I think that face to face is very important. But at the same time, uh, we live in certain times. And the reality is that for the uh, short term, uh, at least for the next probably year or two, uh, it's going to be challenging to meet in person. And who knows what the future is going to look like after that. Um, so, uh, I, I, I can't make a commitment. We've definitely, uh, uh, thought about it. We're trying to think of ways to adapt and, uh, hopefully if we do, uh, I'll be working hard to make sure that, uh, as much as we can, we'll choose a platform that captures the magic of sort of sitting around a table and seeing people face to face. Yeah. There's definitely something special, um, especially when a, a family comes together and sits down yes. and plays a board game. I've experienced that and it, you can't, you can't imitate that on, uh, I mean, you can't imitate, but you, you can't get the exact same thing online. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So. I have yet to get my hands on a copy of the Gatewatch because the only South African (laughs) store that's selling it is currently sold out. You need to stop being so popular so that I can get a copy, please. (laughs) I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But uh, so I know the Everspring is going to be released sometime next year. Can you give me a bit of a teaser? Tell me a little bit about it. Yes. So the Everspring is uh, book two in the Saga of Torn Ten Trees. The Gatewatch is book one. And uh, the Everspring, funnily enough, was actually the story I sat down to write when I first started the series. And after several failed attempts, I realized I hadn't really built the world out. And so I wrote the Gatewatch. I actually titled it the Gatewatch. I wrote it as a like a, a preface, like a one chapter preface that was going to sort of just set the world up for the Everspring. And it ended up just taking on a life of its own. And so... Um, and so, so the Gatewatch sort of uh, is this uh, troll hunting adventure. Uh, these troll hunters travel to Gatewatch, which is a small town in the mountains, and they defend the borders of Naros, which is the realm they live in, against trolls. And so uh, the Gatewatch sort of recounts their adventures um, as they sort of get lost and, and go on this, I, w- I would almost call it a misadventure. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's book one. And book two, The Everspring, the, the focus shifts a little bit. And once again, this was the story I was sort of originally meaning to tell uh, in that um, they're sent on a quest to the Everspring, which is this sort of uh, mythical sort of source of all the world's rivers. And it's far in the north in the lands of the giants. So whereas the first book is very focused on the dwarves and the uh, and the trolls, the second book is much more fo- focused on the giants. And of course, when I say giants, I mean um, like the Jotun of uh, Norse mythology. And so uh, the Jotun um, are perceived as very, very large. They're very strong, just like in the Norse myths, but they're also very wise. And this is something that, you know, if you look at um, giants and trolls and such from uh, mythologies in other parts of Europe and around the world, uh, they're often seen as rather stupid, right? They're they're sort of thick, they're kind of dull. Um, and uh, the trolls definitely are in, uh, in the Norse myths and uh, in the Gatewatch, but the giants 
The giants are extremely wise and they're also immortal. Uh, in the Norse myths, they're famous for fighting against the gods and uh, same in my series as well. They're, they're sort of contending with the gods there too. And so the stakes are upped and uh, uh, I, I can't give away too much more than that. Uh, the only other thing I will say though is that a major influence for the second book was Beowulf. I was reading it constantly as I was writing it and uh, anybody who's familiar with that, um, especially Seamus Heaney's translation is going to recognize a few nods to that. Um, uh, Maria Headley just released an, uh, a new version of Beowulf, which I have yet to get my hands on because once again it's too darn popular but i will get uh, uh, my hands on it and it's uh, i'm really excited to read that as well especially having spent so much time with that uh, particular story and so yes if you're a beowulf fan uh definitely look for some references in book two well that sounds very exciting i think everyone's going to be even more excited uh now that you've let that little uh, tidbit go <laughs> um but the other thing that I was really excited to hear about was this wonderful anthology that is linked to um, Al Thingy. I had it on social media and also on the Myth Legend and Law podcast. On Twitter, I'm just seeing more and more amazing writers, uh, Siobhan Clark, Caitlin Felix, Genevieve Gonicek, to name just a few. They're coming out and saying, hey, I'm one of the writers for the All Thingy anthology. So, I mean, it's so amazing that you brought these uh, wonderful minds together. Um, but what really intrigued me was something you spoke about with Javon. I think you said something about the focus on the connection between um, the Vikings and the Islamic kingdoms at that time. You talked a little bit about that. Uh, wh where did the inspiration behind this focus in particular for the anthology, where did that come from? Yeah, so I'm I'm so excited I can actually finally start talking about this because this was this was under wraps for for months and months and months. But um, yes, yeah, so the Althing anthology is a link to the game, and it's basically we invited a bunch of writers uh, to write short stories inspired by the characters in the game. So we kind of gave them a choice of a few of the characters. They picked one, and they sort of filled in the backstory, uh, which is super cool because as you're playing the game, um, there's not a lot of information on the characters other than the sketch and their name. Uh, so for example, there's characters like uh, Hod the Blind, and there's characters like Out the Cirrus and there's characters like um, Einstein the Unlucky, stuff like that. Uh, and so it was, it's been really cool to kind of just see authors take different approaches to this. And when I first brought it up, I said, you know, we could do a Viking anthology. And one of the editors said, you know what? I read this anthology recently by this amazing writer uh, named Mohammed Ahmed. And he is, uh, uh, he's an incredible writer, a good friend of mine now because I've worked with him closely on this project for the past several months. Uh, and he's the curated the anthology, A Mosque Among the Stars. And that's a collection of uh, Islamic fiction that is uh, sci-fi as well. So it's sci-fi Islamic fiction. It's such a cool blend of um, of themes. And uh, when I approached him at first, he hadn't read a lot of uh, historical fiction. And I was kind of wondering, he's going to be like, who's this weird guy who writes about Viking things that wants me to work with him? But yeah, I approached him and I said, you know, your anthology was great. You know, would you be interested in working on this project? It's a little bit out in left field. And it was so funny. He's like, oh, Vikings. Yeah, everybody loves Vikings. I'll, I'll totally do that. That'd be great. So yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we, we connected really well. And it's been really cool because historically speaking, I mean, the Viking age, we're talking about 800 to about 1000 AD. Um, uh, the Vikings, this is kind of their golden age. If there, if there was one, they're exploring, they're raiding, they're sort of setting up new settlements, they're discovering places um, like Iceland, they're traveling uh, and, and interacting with peoples uh, all the way across the Atlantic in, in North America, which they called Vinland. Um, so that's exciting. But what a lot of people don't recognize is, uh, especially from a Western perspective, is the Islamic kingdoms at that time too were also flourishing. So you had the House of Wisdom in Baghdad and you had the uh, Cordoba Caliphate over in Spain, and um, uh, they they were simultaneously thriving. There's there's many different accounts, both in the Norse sagas and even from Arabic texts, of interactions between the two cultures. The reason we don't hear a lot about this is because mainland Europe, uh, what we kind of think of as sort of Christian Europe, uh, Holy Roman. Uh, church kind of thing. Um, they were in the dark ages. This was not a great time for Europe. And so for Europe, that whole section of history is sort of written off as like a, well, that wasn't a great time. But um, for the Vikings and for uh, the Islamic kingdoms, that was actually a real time of growth. And so we thought, wow, this is something that's kind of unex unexplored. This is a cool way to kind of bring our two sort of passions and interests together. And um, and so we started out and uh, Muhammad was able to connect with uh, many of his uh, friends who wrote um, uh, Islamic fiction and some Islamic science fiction, some Islamic historical fiction and brought them together. Uh, I was able to invite a bunch of my friends who write uh, Viking historical fiction and the the interconnections that we've been able to uh, sort of bring to the table here are just so cool. Like I can't say enough about this anthology and how cool it's going to be. And I, I and I literally can't say too much right now, but um, I can say that it's, uh, it's really going to be eye-opening. Um, there's an incredible cast. Like, uh, you know, every day um, uh, here recently, different authors have been sort of hinting and peeking and we're starting to put the word out on the anthology. But um, yeah, I can just say this is 
this is an incredible collection. I basically felt like Muhammad and I got to just sit down and sort of, you know, draft a superhero team of writers and we invited them and almost everybody said yes. So it was, uh, it's, it's been really exciting and I'm excited uh, for this to kind of uh, get on the world. We're going to kickstart it um, sometime in the spring, probably April or May. And so uh, if you're interested in it, uh, keep an eye on the Outland Entertainment website, keep an eye on Twitter. I'll be talking about it lots and uh, on Muhammad's uh, Twitter as well. That's so amazing. Could, could you, are you allowed to tell me maybe how many authors are in this or how many short stories or is that under wrap? Uh, you know what? I'll tell you, we have 14 lined up right now. So we're still in the editing stages uh, of uh, going through the uh, novels and, and writing them. But um, yeah, there's 14 um, authors that we're currently have working with. Hopefully all those stories make it all the way into the anthology. That would be great. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to throw this out here as a tempting bit. We've got a very exciting person to write the forward to. And uh, um, I will say uh, only this. I won't say any names, but I will say that they are connected with uh, creating some of the Marvel Universe uh, characters. So anyways, I'm just going to I'm just going to put that out there as a teaser. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to say anything else. Uh, I'm just going to kind of let the buzz grow. But anyways, yeah, the person we have writing for the forward were really excited that they were uh, uh, willing to, uh, to to write something for this. And I think honestly, I think this project is going to start some very um, important and interesting conversations because uh, uh, Vikings and a sort of Norse culture in particular uh, is often sort of painted with a certain brand of uh, sort of negative, uh, um, I would say kind of like dangerous ideas. So, you know, um, a lot of people, when they hear that I'm into Viking things, they say, oh, does that mean like you're a white supremacist? Oh, no, no, I'm not. But unfortunately, that sort of myth and narrative has been tied to historically and in modern times, some pretty, some pretty negative images. And I was talking about this with Muhammad the other day, in that uh, uh, a similar thing, unfortunately, has happened with Islam, especially following 9-11 here in North America, is that, you know, to say that you um, are a, a Muslim sometimes, um, people immediately assume a bunch of things um, that are very negative about what you believe and kind of how you live your life. And I'm not saying that those two are the same thing. Those are those are totally sort of different things. But there is that sort of commonality of, um, uh, you know, can we create a conversation between these two um, and maybe clarify some things about this historical you know, accuracy of, you know, like, yeah, Vikings and um, uh, Muslims that didn't interact. And in fact, one thing I was like to point out is that the only first eyewitness account, firsthand eyewitness account that we have of Vikings is Ibn Fadlan, who travels north um, uh, from Baghdad to uh, kind of research and, and, and uh, uh, take some notes um, for um, the, the caliph there uh, about the peoples who were living in Russia there um, uh, by the Volga River and um, all the other accounts we have of Vikings are uh, you know written several hundred years after by the Vikings themselves like the Icelander Snorri Sturluson um, are written by Christian monks uh, who obviously have their own sort of um, their own sort of bent and there's a there's a big sort of political push to sort of demonize Vikings in the in the mainland Europe literature that's where the things like horned helmets and stuff come from uh, or they come from uh, other historians who are writing later on and uh, so I always like to point that out. If people are like Vikings and and uh, and Muslims, did they really attract? Yes, yes, they did. And in fact, um, they they probably fought with each other in some circumstances. They probably fought against each other in other circumstances. Uh, a lot of people are, are not always aware of the the reach and the sort of the spread of both. Um, the Vikings, how far they traveled throughout the world, as well as uh, uh, some of the scholars from the Islamic kingdoms, how far north, east, west, south they went. No, that's it's it's amazing. I think um, the anthology is going to interest, inform, delight people, but I think it's also going to bring people together from different areas, different backgrounds, which I think is so special. I think yeah, that's that really is our hope. Yeah, I hope that is the is the case. Yeah. Before we wrap up, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about your other passion, which is music. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I said earlier, writing, music, game design, I don't know, you know, God is supposed to shout out the gifts, I don't know what happened here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you're an extremely creative person, I think is proof of that, and that also you combine your passion with uh, for writing and game design in that. Um, how does How does music work into all of this? Great question. Great question. So yeah, my my, my first sort of like creative uh, sort of endeavor was actually in the music and uh, it was with a uh, Celtic band called the the Ugly Mugs. And that was a, a band I'd started with a few friends um, back in Edmondson when I lived there. And uh, I still continue to, to write songs with them and, and play with them whenever we can manage to. COVID obviously has made things a little more complicated, uh, but uh, we really do enjoy that. And um, I, I grew up in a family of musicians. Like I said, my parents met on a music team when they grew up. My dad was very involved in music. His family loved music. My grandpa was was a music teacher at a school. He was also a jazz musician in Vancouver um, for several decades. He started gigging when he was a teenager and continued well into his retirement. And so um, I kind of just grew up with music and it wasn't like, I don't know, 
you know, other people, you know, maybe, maybe grew up in a home where they speak two languages, right? Maybe they speak English and German. And then, you know, it's, like, oh, it's so amazing. You can speak a second language. Like, oh, wow, I only speak one. That's, that's a hard thing to, you know, even wrap my mind around. Whereas if you grew up in that household, it's just like, well, you know, people spoke German and you just learn German when people are, you know, around you. And that's, that's how it happened. It wasn't this sort of um, thing where you sat down and said, oh, I'm going to achieve this incredible thing. Uh, and I kind of felt the same with music. Like music was just like around when I grew up. And so um, I, you know, I took piano and I played guitar and I sang in choirs. Um, we we're very involved in playing music at our church as well. And so that was a lot of, you know, every week um, playing in the band or singing that sort of thing. Uh, there was a lot of music. And so, so for me on one hand, I, 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 music is just kind of like another language in terms of like, yeah, I just, I was, it was there when I grew up, but I did really discover and enjoy, um, uh, Celtic music in particular, uh, and maritime music. I think I discovered it most, uh, strongly through, uh, a band named Great Big C. And if you've never heard of Great Big C, they are a band from Canada, uh, particularly they're from Newfoundland, which is an island off the East coast. And they've got a very distinctive sound and they're, they're very famous, um, all over the world, but particularly in Canada as being kind of leaders in folk music. And so, um, all the people in my band, we really were inspired particularly by Great Big C, but also by many other sort of, uh, Celtic and particularly maritime and even Acadian, which is sort of the French area of of uh, Eastern Canada or a specific area of French Canada. Uh, we were inspired by that sort of music and we sort of, uh, we love the idea of kind of working with acoustic instruments and, and lots of voices we all sing. And so we, there's five of us and we, I play guitar. We've got a bass player who also plays the Bowron, which is like the Celtic drum. Uh, we've got a mandolin player and two fiddle players and uh, we all sing as well so doing the the big kind of five part harmonies and stuff like that was also a fun part and uh yeah yeah it's it, it was a really cool way to um, um sort of celebrate the music we loved uh, we wrote songs together we covered songs and uh, uh w once again i would just say the same thing i said about uh writing stories and, and designing games. Uh, what we loved about Celtic music mostly was the stories. And the stories are typically sad. My wife always jokes, she's like, why do all the Irish songs have to be so depressing? Uh, but, it's a, but it's a story, right? You kind of get looped into the story and the romance and the tragedy. And it's a, it's a short story, right? It might only take three minutes to kind of take you through the story. But there's that same level of you're trying to, uh, you know, uh, tell a story that people can get immersed in, right? They can kind of picture themselves in, they can relate to the characters, they can kind of see kind of what's happening and feel that emotion. And um, yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it was fun to do that with the band. And I, I continue to enjoy playing gigs whenever we can. We are our, our best day of the year is always St. Patrick's Day. We always do a big St. Patrick's Day gig. Unfortunately, last year, because of COVID, that was the first year, I think in like seven years, we weren't able to do one. Uh, but hopefully we'll get back up and playing uh, once uh, once our pandemic stuff is sort of sorted out. So yeah, yeah, the Ugly Mugs, it's been a lot of fun to write with them. That's incredible. And your, your your family sounds so interesting. I have to now request that the next book that you write is a memoir because... From what you told me about your family, I mean, I remember the listener episode that you, I mean, the listener story that you sent for our episode a couple of months ago, something about pirates mm -hmm. and sharks. And I was just sitting there like, what, who is this man? <laughs> <laughs> and what is going on with these families? So I think that's going to be in your, your next book. Oh, okay. All right. So the request has been put in. Well, keep keep in mind that like I, I, I can't verify most of those stories, but I will also say that, um, you know, in the Maritimes, you know, fishing villages, not that fishermen are ever, ever known for like telling big tales or sort of expanding the truth. But anyways, yeah, let's just say that storytelling, yeah, it's been a big thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that under consideration. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so other than that, let the listeners know about when our thingy is coming out, where you can find the Gatewatch, when's the release date for Everspring, the anthology, everything. Okay, everything. Here it comes. Everything. So first off, uh, I'll thingy the card game. Yes, it is on Kickstarter right now. And I believe um, as of Monday when this episode comes out, it will be the second last day of the Kickstarter. And so the last uh, uh, day to fund will be December 1st, which will be the Tuesday. So if you'd like to get in on that, um, now's your last chance. And thank you so much for, for having me on here just in time to, to, to get that word out. Um, the Everspring is slated for about April 2021. We don't have a solid date, but if you'd like to sneak a peek at the cover, you can search up the Everspring on Fan Fi Addict. That is a book review site that uh, agreed to do a cover reveal for us. So thanks to David S. again for um, for hosting that. And last but not least, uh, the anthology will uh, be on Althingy the Anthology. Uh, we're exploring the interactions between um, uh, Vikings and the Islamic Kingdom at the time. Um, that will be out uh, on Kickstarter again in the spring, probably in uh, uh, April or May. So if you'd like to keep track of those things, um, I've got a website, joshuagillingham.ca. I'm pretty active on Twitter, Josh M. Gillingham, that's M as in monkey. And uh, the Outland Entertainment website will also uh, have lots of information regarding the anthology and the game. So outlandentertainment.com uh, is another place you can check out. And that's, uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. Josh, it's been so, so amazing to have you back on the show. I enjoyed it even more than last time. Thank you very much for coming on to the show and telling me about your wonderful projects. And I know it was last minute, so thanks for making some space in your schedule. 
The pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much for having me on again. I, yeah, I always enjoy our chats. I wish you the best of luck with Ao Tengi, and I cannot wait for the release of the Everspring and the anthology. Thank you. Before you go, we have a lovely clip of music from Josh and his band, The Ugly Mugs. This is Mary's Wedding. Step we gaily on we go Heel for heel and toe for toe Arm in arm and row on row for Mary's wedding Step we gaily on we go Heel for heel and toe for toe Arm in arm and row on row for Mary's wedding Up and down, myrtle green and bracken brown, past the sheilings through the town, all for sake of Mary. Step we gaily on we go, heel for heel and toe for toe, arm and arm and row on row for Mary's wedding. And that brings us to the end of the bonus episode. Please follow Joshua Gillingham on Twitter at Josh M. Gillingham. Check out his book The Gatewatch, available on crowsnestbooks.com as well as on Amazon and other selected stores. And go support his amazing game All Thingy on Kickstarter. There's still time. I will leave all relevant links in the show description as well as on social media. Other than that, I'll see you next week with an all-new ancient myth, legend, or tale from our beautiful continent of Africa. Until then, tell your loved ones you love them, thank the angel on your shoulder, stay safe, stay sexy, and stay legendary. Bye!